here is uh, Elisabeth Jacquet de la Guerre. So Elisabeth uh, Jacquet, de la Jacquet uh, Elisabeth Claude Jacquet was born in 1665 uh, in Paris. And uh, here is a, is a map of Paris in the 17th century. And uh, her father, Claude Jacquet, was a harpsichord and um, organ builder. So she was part of a family that was already into music. And so apparently uh, it's, we know that uh, at a very young age, she was performing at the court of uh, Louis XIV and uh, her first documented appearance there was when she was 12, but it said that actually she, um, she, uh, she played there uh, even before that. But uh, it's when uh, Louis XIV heard her, that apparently was her fourth appearance uh, at the court, that he decided to invite her at the court where uh, she had an amazing education. And uh, if I can um, talk a little bit aside of that, uh, um, I think that, um, uh, Louis XIV's uh, secret wife, Madame de Maintenon, uh, was a great influence to him in terms of educating uh, girls. And um, so Madame de Maintenon uh, could be also actually a topic of a, a future <laughs> cocktails and chit chat because she inspired the king to create uh, La Maison Royale de Saint-Louis in Saint-Cyr uh, that was so set up in 1684 and uh, La Maison Royale was a boarding school for uh, young girls coming from noble families, families who had lost their fortune and uh, so it was for them an opportunity to also be educated in not only um, general education but actually also very high music education like you know um, in the orphanage in venice uh, like uh, the orphanage of la pieta for example uh, so it was really um, something that she um, inspired the king to do that and so louis the 14th uh, has actually even helped uh, other women composer uh, at his time and uh, here for example il, back in august we talked about uh, Antonia Bembo, who he helped as well. So, um, but thanks also to Madame de Maintenon for being a great inspiration. Um, but now let's go back to uh, Elizabeth. So then she was at the court. And although we don't know totally uh, how she was educated in music, we can imagine that uh, those uh, great composers, uh, Jean-Henri d'Anglebert, Michel, Michel Richard de Lalande and François Couperin, have been uh, some of uh, her teachers, uh, which must have been amazing. I can imagine being a young composer at the, at the court of Louis XIV and having those great composers being your teachers. Uh, it's like this that Elizabeth kicked off her career in a way uh, and was very, very fortunate. Um, and um, yeah. and uh, so then, of course, she became uh, interested in writing more and more music and she uh, has been a, a composer that was actually uh, very prolific at her time and uh, so I would like uh, to ask to Kelly to share more about this and uh, about her work and also Kelly about what you're going to play for us. Sure, I'd be happy to. So what we're seeing here is Jacques de la Guerre's first publication. It's from her first book of harpsichord pieces. It was printed in 1687 and what we're seeing here in the slide is the title page of the first edition. This is one of the first uh, few collections of harpsichord pieces printed in France in the 17th century. And this collection is made up of suites of dances for solo harpsichord. It includes unmeasured preludes as the opening for each suite. So if we can turn to the next slide, here is a picture of an unmeasured prelude. 
And this is the actual one that I'll be performing on tonight's program. This is the very first piece in the collection of her first publication. So the Unmeasured Prelude is a fascinating French genre that came out of the tradition of lute preludes. You'll notice that De La Guerre writes only the notes, but not the rhythm here. So we have a whole bunch of whole notes and long kind of elegant slurs, right, that show the performer the phrasing and the grouping of the notes. Because the performer gets to shape the rhythm of the piece, it gives these preludes a lot of improvisatory quality. And we know that Jacques de la Guerre was known for her own improvisation of this style of music. So I, we have a contemporary who wrote that she, quote, had a marvelous facility for playing preludes and fantasies off the cuff. Sometimes she improvises one or another for a whole half hour with tunes and harmonies of great variety and in quite the best possible taste, quite charming her listeners. So this one is not half an hour long, <laughs> you'll be glad to know, um, but you'll get a sense of her style here and this kind of fascinating um, unmeasured prelude style. So in the next slide, we have the performance of the first prelude in D minor. Hope you enjoy. And I'm so sorry. Maybe uh, Kelly, can you... Mm, let me see here. I don't think I have the ability to forward it. Yeah. Kelly, there's actually a question for you in the chat. If you oh, want. sure, I can take that. What are the hash marks next to some of the notes? Those, I have to look back. I think they're ornaments, um, right? So the big slur notes are, they're a little bit mysterious, which is kind of the fascination of this kind of piece, but they kind of show you the, the feeling and the grouping of the phrases, but the little note, the little slurs, are, sorry, like hash marks, I think that you're mentioning, are trills and mordants. So even within the context of this very open freestyle, it's still very French, right? So you still have lots of ornaments. So she's notating where the trills and mordants are gonna be. And you'll hear halfway through this piece, um, it actually becomes measured. I think it'll be very clear when it goes from the freestyle into the measured style. And then the very last bit kind of morphs back into the unmeasured style here. So hope you enjoy, it looks like it's ready.
Great, Kelly. Thank you so much. So I'm going to continue on here talking about a few other publications from Elizabeth. Around the time she published this first harpsichord collection, uh, De La Guerre also composed many other works. So what we're seeing here is the title page from her ballet. This was from around 1790. The libretto to this work survives, but the music unfortunately has been lost. So we don't have that. Just a few years later, at the height of her influence, she composed her opera, Cephal and Procris, and this is the title page of that one. This is a five act work. It was the first opera written by a woman in France. It ran for six performances in March of 1694, and we'll hear more about this opera soon. Um, so moving forward here, the years around 1707 were personally very hard for De La Guerre because she lost her parents, her husband, and her only son within a very short period of time. Um, but despite these tragedies, her creative output actually intensified. She published a second set of harpsichord pieces, six violin sonatas, a collection of trio sonatas, several sets of vocal cantatas. So what we're seeing here is the title page of her 1707 Sonata Collection for Violin and Harpsichord. These are very masterful works. Um, they combine elements of the French style with elements of the Italian Sonata, and they showcase uh, very flashy violin writing that is often associated with the works of Italian composers like Corelli. So moving on to the next picture, we have a title page from one of her cantata collections. She wrote two whole collections on biblical subjects and one on secular Greek myths. And this one that we're seeing is on the secular Greek ones. Um, one cantata that I personally play often, um, just I'm very fond of it, is called The Passage Through the Red Sea. And it tells musically the story of Moses dramatically parting the waters. So that's an example of one of her cantatas. So moving forward here, around the same time, um, De La Guerre also started a series of harpsichord recitals at her home, and we see her here in her salon element playing her harpsichord. A contemporary source said, quote, all the great musicians and fine connoisseurs went eagerly to hear her. The musical salon was innovative because at the court, social mingling and hierarchies were key, while the music was part of the background. Right. But in her own salon performances and her own space, the music was now the main focus of the gathering. So now I'm going to turn this over to Celine and oh, Daphne. Thank you so much, Kelly. Well, now we're going to talk more about uh, her uh, opera. But before, maybe we should also uh, talk a little bit, introduce a little bit what is a tragédie lyrique. And so I would like to ask Daphne to tell us a little bit about that. Happily. Hello, everyone. So the slide that you're seeing here is the title page of Cadmus Sermion. This is the very first tragédie lyrique ever written. And as you will notice, it doesn't say opera on it. And that is on purpose. The word opera is omitted because the idea in 1673 is to create a whole new style of song theater. So um, this new style uh, is kind of experimental in a way, and it integrates uh, things that people are familiar with, which is the Italian opera, and things that the French like particularly, which is, for example, ballet and uh, theater. So who is making this experimental uh, new opera genre? It's, uh, you can see his name actually on the page, Monsieur de Lully, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully, 
uh, this man is very, very important um, for in our story uh, because he is the inventor of this new type of opera. He is actually of Italian origin, but he spent most of his life at the court of Louis XIV. He was extremely ambitious and he spent most of his life actually staying at the top of the pyramid, making sure that he was the king of anything musical happening at court. Uh, luckily, uh, his talent matched his ambition. So uh, what he wrote was pretty brilliant. So he was the one who came up with the idea to create this new genre uh, that he called Tragédie en Musique, as you can see. So the theatrical element is very, very important. Uh, theater is very, very popular in Paris, especially the great tragedies of Racine and Corneille. So he's trying to stick to that. Therefore, uh, Tragédie Lyrique will be like theater tra tragedy. It will have five acts as opposed to three acts for Italian opera. So that's a very lengthy piece. It can go up to four hours. Yes. Uh, so Cadmus Hermione was the very first attempt. It was, as you can imagine, kind of a hit or miss. Well, it was a great hit, actually. A king absolutely adored this. So it kind of created a precedent. He, he created the new formula. And from then on, Lully would go on writing approximately one tragedy en musique per year until his death. So there are approximately uh, 13 tragédies lyriques uh, by uh, Lully. And what they all have in common, I said they all have five acts, but they all have in common, uh, the stories are usually taken from Greek mythology. So this is kind of flattering also uh, the court uh, by, um, it's addressing itself to people who know Greek mythology, right? So there you go. For example, uh, we have Cadmus Hermione, which is a Greek story. We have Alceste here, which is also a Greek mythology. Uh, we have the characters who are always noble kings, queens, gods, goddesses, you know. Uh, the tone is always very serious and very very dramatic and the themes are usually something a variation of honor against love like what your duty is against what you really want to do and here you have a slide this is a very interesting slide showing you how these uh um, operas were performed. Uh, if any one of you has been in Versailles, you might recognize this place. This is uh, the central courtyard of the palace. At the time, during Louis XIV's time, there was no opera in the palace, so stages would be set up here, there, uh, even in the stables. And this is one of the courtyards that has been set up for this Tragédie Lyrique called Alceste. You can probably, so you can see the stage of the performance. Uh, there, the orchestra is actually right underneath the performance on either side, on the on the sides. And then the king is in the middle. You can, I, I don't have a cursor here to show you, or I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here is the king. And the whole scene is lit by thousands or at least hundreds of candles. And if you can see the candles, this is the month of July. So everyone is outside enjoying an outdoor performance uh, of Alceste. So that's what I wanted to say a little bit about Tragédie Lyrique to give you an idea. Of course, our Tragédie Lyrique that we're singing tonight is, uh, you see here is 1674, ours is 20 years later. So it's a genre that survived even Lully's lifetime. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, uh, Daphne. And so, uh, Kevin, maybe can you tell us a little bit about yes. this, uh, how this opera was written and why and who? <laughs> Absolutely. So yes, this is, um, uh, Cephale Procris, Procris, excuse my French, literally. Um, and it was the first opera written, I think it was the only opera written by De La Guerre, correct? Yes. But it was, in fact, the first opera written by a woman and performed in France. Um, mm -hmm. And this was only written ten, just 10 years after Lully's death. So, um, as Daphne uh, just said, this is um, a tragedy lyrique, and uh, the influence is... Is, is huge. Uh, you can definitely tell that the, the, the structure, the five act structure uh, has taken off since even, even after Lully's passing. Um, the duet that we're performing today is in fact the beginning, the prologue of the piece. And I'm not sure in, if that counts as the first act, 
of the five structure? No, it doesn't. No. Um, but I, it is my understanding that, you know, though how we think of opera now, all the lights are down low, everyone's quiet, and we all focus on the stage. My understanding is that back then people were eating and drinking and very much in a party mode as the overture and as, you know, as the, the, the drama begins. And so this duet acts as kind of like a tone setting for, hey, we're starting this piece now, but also let's, 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 um, let's talk about how great King Louis XIV is. You know, so we act as like the Greek chorus to setting up the stage, but we're also praising, you know, the patron who very much supported arts at the, uh, during his reign. So, um, yeah, uh, Kelly spoke uh, a lot about how um, De La Guerre's uh, improvisatory skills really set her apart from many of her contemporaries, and you can... You, can, you, you got a sense of that from the harpsichord piece, but she also is able to, she's so versatile that she can write to the form of French opera so greatly. And uh, yeah, it's a great piece and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Kevin. So here is a, in the prologue of Céphale et Procris, um, the duet between Flore et Pan. Il est temps que chacun se rassemble en ses murs, et à l'aurore vigilante, commençons sa route brillante, précède le soleil qui monte dans les cieux. Déjà l'aurore vigilante, commençons sa route brillante, Précède le soleil qui monte dans les cieux. On voit dans ces belles périodes une des jours et des saisons et les lourds de ces rayons à l'éveil de nos prières. On voit dans ces Gloire 
soit éternel, que sa gloire soit éternel, qu'elle dure autant que les dieux. Great, bravi! <laughs> Thank you so much. So this was the, a, a duet from the prologue of um, Cephale Procri, where uh, the, the floor, floor et Pont are singing at the glory, for the glory of the king of Louis XIV. Uh, but now let's go into the drama, the drama of this story then after this in five acts. So Daphne, would you like to tell us about all this drama? <laughs> Oh yes, uh, don't be fooled by how light this piece just sounded, because what's coming up is something very, very, very tragic. Um, so as the name Tragédie Lyrique indicates, naturally the story has to end badly. Um, so here uh, the librettist of the opera chose, um, chose a Greek myth uh, that he he got inspired from the uh, metamorphosis of Ovid, which was almost a classic at the time. So he changed the story around a little bit, but he but he kept the main um, the main lines of the story. So the main line is the following: We are among uh, nobility here, so we are in Athens, uh, in ancient Greece, and uh, there is a wedding coming up. Procris is supposed, though the, uh, the king's daughter is supposed to marry uh, Cephal, who is a hero who just came back victorious from battle. So everyone is getting ready for this very happy event. Alas, uh, the priestess who was going to um, uh, who is going to uh, celebrate the wedding comes out of the temple and says, "No, everyone, wait. Uh, we cannot." hold this ceremony because I just heard from the gods they are not happy with this wedding. Uh, Procris needs to marry someone else, Boré, another prince. So immediately naturally there's a general stupor of what's going on. Uh, there is nothing that can be done. The will of the gods needs to be obeyed. So the father reluctantly uh, says okay I will obey the gods. Naturally Procris and Cephal, both uh, who are very much in love with each other, um, are devastated. And the rest of the opera talks about this. Um, so I'm going to spare you the details because, as I said, it's a very lengthy five act opera. Lots of things happen. But just to cut to the chase, um, the gods have been meddling with this wedding because the goddess Dawn, Aurora, is actually in love with the hero and she wants to keep him for herself. So she's the one actually manipulating everyone like puppets. Um, and unfortunately, as I said, it does not end well. As you can see in the illustration that you have, there is a woman lying down uh, and she has been wounded. This is Pocris, actually. And the man standing and looking um, uh, surprised uh, is actually Cephal. What has happened is at some point Cephal and this other man, this other prince, Boré, uh, enter into a fight and Procris tries to go between them and separate them and unfortunately Cephal who was trying to wound Boré, right, don't know if you're following me here, wounds his beloved instead. So he ends up killing his own beloved. And after that, what the image doesn't show is that he himself decides to commit suicide because um, he cannot live with himself. So it's as dark as dark can be, right? Uh, now, um, about the aria that I am going to sing for you tonight, uh, this aria is situated at the beginning relatively of the piece and this is a moment where after the priestess has announced that Pocris has to marry someone else, uh, Pocris isolates herself. She is by herself in the garden and she's just talking to herself and she's saying how can I live with this? I do not want to marry this other man. I am twice unhappy because a I am losing the man that I love and b I have to marry someone whom I hate. Um, when I was singing this I was thinking a little bit about um, 
the fact that we are so fortunate in our society to be able to choose who we marry. This is not necessarily the case all around the world. So I was thinking a little bit about um, perhaps some women who have been forced into weddings that they were not happy about and how difficult this must be to have to obey your culture, to have to obey your religion, but your heart is rebelling against this. And what happens is that here Procris invokes death. This is her only uh, exit, right? She, this is the only thing she can do to escape her destiny. So she's asking death to come and free her. And you will hear probably in the piece at some point, um, Kelly has tried to do her best to evoke this strange atmosphere all of a sudden. Normally there would be something in the theater very impressive like a machine or something fuming or something falling from the sky or the lights coming in and out. You have to imagine this for yourselves. Um, but something is happening. The gods are actually intervening. And so Pocris thinks, wow, it worked. I invoked death and now death is coming. Uh, I'm going to be freed. So at the end, she's almost happy. She's like, yay, come, come death, come and pick me up. Uh, unfortunately, it is not death. It is something even worse, but I don't want to be too lengthy here because there are four acts uh, behind this aria. But I hope you can, I hope I was able to evoke um, her desperation and her kind of surprise when she hears this subterranean noise. Enjoy. Brave, bravissime! Wow, great! Thank you so much. Um, and 
yeah so um this uh, these were uh, some two excerpts of uh, cephaliprocrit and uh, so the, the only opera that elisabeth jacquet de la guerre wrote and uh, i would like to add that uh, so when it was performed um then it, it was performed for some days but then it didn't unfortunately had too much success also because uh, at that time uh, the king also was more interested in more uh, um, religious topics apparently so then they didn't continue to to perform and of course this would be an amazing opera uh, for us to perform uh, but again uh, a prologue five acts and a huge orchestra <laughs> Well, I mean, it's in, it's on on our radar, right? But uh, one day, one day we'll do it. Um, and um, then for Elizabeth, uh, so we arrive here at the end of her the portrait, this short portrait of her life. So she died in uh, in in seventeen twenty nine, and she's buried at the parish of Saint Eustache, where she was actually it was her parish, right, her church. And so she's she's buried there, uh, and so merci Elisabeth. Uh, I would like to thank her uh, because I mean she's uh, she's an inspiration for uh, uh, many of us and especially for women. Uh, she opened the door for uh, women composer and women creative also uh, in many other genres and. Um, of course, we can think that she was fortunate to meet the king and then that, that you know, maybe you know, for sure, many other women or even men couldn't meet him and, <laughs> and, and be sponsored right by him. Uh, but I'm sure that even also for her, this must have been um, difficult also at her time, right, to, uh, to be able uh, to, uh, to go forward with her career, especially with all what she, she lived, right? So I would like to say thank you. Uh, merci, Elisabeth.